First, I want to thank Hasid for even being here because he's a very broken man after Liverpool's recent results. <laughs> so the fact he could make it in here in one piece is amazing. Um, so Hasid works with this small little media, hokey, pocky little startup uh, with a three-letter acronym, uh, which isn't funded by public donations or broadcasting fees or anything of the kind. Uh, or at least that's how he'd like to believe. So Hasid's been at the BBC for a while. Nine years? And eleven. 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 Two of them, they didn't know he was around. Um, so <laughs> eleven years and in a variety of roles. And um, he has suffered for his art. He's had hostage training. He's um, done performance art. He's had all kinds of training of how to work in hostile environments, some of which he showed us. And um, just before I let him get on with it, um, I just wanted to say, if you want a bunch of entertaining uh, minutes, you should mention citizen journalism, advocacy, and objectivity in the same sentence. Because Hasid is one of the dying breed of people who believes journalists should and are objective. So it's led to many wonderful hours at Berkman where people have debated the objectivity of journalists. So with that, I'm going to let Hasid start. Thank you, Mo. And just thank you, everyone, for coming, especially my Neiman fellows and everyone else here. Um, I should come back next week as well because Malavika herself is going to talk about Another really important India-related subject, she's talking about the UID project and the massive privacy concerns um, that are to do with that. So, yeah, I've been at the BBC for about a decade now and I came here or originally to look into how the growth of the internet in India will have an impact on lots of aspects of society, which is obviously too big a subject to even really contemplate in a year. Um, I'm a journalist, so very quickly focused on news and what that growth means for how news is presented, how it's consumed, the business models around it. So if I hadn't been at Harvard this year, been lucky enough to be at Harvard this year, I would have been in India, probably would have been in India right now, uh, looking at this. In a move that I believe no American politician has no sound. Modi has been making camp Hmm? Okay. In a move that I cannot believe no American politician has tried, Modi has been making campaign appearances via hologram. That's right. Modi has gone Tupac at Coachella. And that, that is how you convince, that is how you convince undecided voters. Uh, so, uh, who are you going to vote for? Modi. Why? Because he appeared to me as a hologram and told me he'd give me a toilet. <laughs> I'm not going to get into politics here um, because it's too dangerous. But, and for those who don't know, that's Narendra Modi. He is the right-wing prime ministerial candidate, doing pre pretty well in polls. We're not sure what's going to happen, but he's kind of one of the, the two main guys in this election. Uh, the bit that I want to focus on, as that clip alluded to, is the role of sort of technology in this election, but also now in India as a whole. Um, in politics, in political campaigning, certainly Mr. Modi and his team are very, very active on social media and have been for a while. Um, they use all the networks and as a consequence they have their fair, fair share of trolls and they also post selfies. Um, they this has been described as India's first digital election, and it's worth sort of examining, examining that claim. Um, I mean, certainly compared to 2009, it is, because back then there was none of this at all. No politicians were tweeting, there was no online campaigning, there was none of that at all. Partly because it was a new platform, these are new platforms in India, but also because India, even less so than today, was not a country which had the internet in any great numbers. But nowadays, you've got 100 million Facebook users, 30 million people on Twitter, 50 million people using WhatsApp, and it's growing incredibly fast, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. And overall, around about 200 million internet users. So there is an internet in India, there is a digital audience in India, and no politician will be stupid enough to ignore those kind of numbers, even though the context of the 1.2 billion it isn't a huge number, and it's still pretty much the elite 
um, it's still a lot of votes. So on one hand, you could, you could argue that India is digitizing and people are moving online and the internet is growing and its influence on the country is, is spreading. But here are some other figures. And this is the thing that I came to Harvard with, this skepticism and pessimism about India's prospects. And based on things that I'd seen myself, things that I know, and some very basic numbers, which I'm going to show you. So a billion people don't have internet access. 300 million people don't even have electricity. And we heard from that clip, 600 million people don't have a toilet at home. And there are 300 illiterate people, 300 million uh, illiterate people in India. So you look at that and you think, how is it possible for everyone to be hooked up to the internet when those basic development um, indices haven't been fixed and are being fixed pretty slowly in some cases in some parts of the country. And that was my initial pessimism. I thought that it's just not possible for India to be thought of as a country which is digitizing or that digital revolution is taking place. I mean in Britain or in America or anywhere else um, we, 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 we moved online, if I can use that phrase, um, pretty seamlessly. We all had phones, we all, had, we all have electricity, we all have TVs, we all have those basic things um, there's not a big jump for all of us to make the same technology leaps. But in India, at the same time as people not having toilets, there are millions and millions of phones. Here's an example. This is a $45 smartphone. It's probably not even the cheapest one on the market, but it's got a touch screen, it's got decent functionality, it runs on a, on a I think an old version of an Android platform, and, and it works. Basically, it works as a, as a smartphone. It's not exactly this, but it's, it's a pretty good approximation. Um, and we're expecting 200 million more of these to be sold in India this year. So it doesn't seem as though the lack of basic amenities is a barrier to people buying phones and connecting and getting online. You know, I was in India in January, and... I hadn't really looked at it like this for you know for a long time. I've mean, obviously been to India loads of times, and I've done lots of work there. But on this trip, I was specifically looking at what people are doing in terms of connecting to the internet and what devices people have. And I may be slow to this because I've not been living there for a while. But you know, people like your drivers, your elevator operators, you know, even cleaners having smartphones. Um, so they really are. I mean, they're replacing these things. I've got an example of the kind of phone that people have had you know forever in India and these things are not I mean mine's mine's broken as well these things aren't going to last forever this is like the most basic Nokia you can find and it costs when I bought this in 2009 it cost about $30 even back then um, and now $45 can get you that thing um, so if you want to have a look at this so <laughs> exhibit A, exhibit a. Um, but these smartphone buyers aren't necessarily connecting to the internet because what this phone can do, it can take nice pictures, you can play music, you can watch videos, you can do all sorts of things. You don't necessarily need to connect to the internet. But the people who make the handsets, the people who um, run the mobile networks and the uh, internet companies themselves, you know, really want that audience. They really want people to, to go to the internet and consume content, create content, do the things that we all do and drive that, that part of the economy. So what kind of content and what kind of platforms work in this market? Here's one. This is the thing which is developed in Cambridge. This is a very simple mobile money app. And it's really useful in places like India because when you're making small cash transactions, what you used to have to do, or you still do in most cases, is um, instead of traveling a long distance to hand over a small amount of money which is not you know very economical you instead pay you instead use a middleman um, who takes a cut and that person delivers that cash payment and takes a cut and you know it's obviously not a safe way of doing things because apart from the expense of the commission you know often the money is stolen and you, you know never gets to where it's supposed to go so with things like this you can make small cash payments and do it safely and securely you can do all those things Cutting the it's genuinely, genuinely useful product. This is a company which is based actually here in Cambridge, which came out of MIT. The other thing is that we know it works online, and it's as big in India as it is anywhere else, is, is entertainment. I'm just going to play you a clip of a 
something which is massive on YouTube. Um, the non-Indians in the room won't really understand this, but I'll explain later. Mr. Arjun Kejriwal with the Mehu, I'm Director Cap. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm coming, Arnab Ji. Please continue. Arnab Ji, 60 years ago, there was a film called Mughal Aajam, which was a better film, a super hit. What did they film? They were on the name of the car, they were on 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 the car. वो जाग रही है, क्रांति आ रही है और यही क्रांति है। ये आम आदमी है, ये आम आदमी फिर मनाएगा। One minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. First of all, you cannot speak for so long on my show, and that too in Hindi. For our English viewer, I'll translate what he said. He said that the Indian storytelling in cinema is pathetic. He used a lot of curse words to describe Indian filmmakers, and then he claimed. That at a party he got drunk and then had a fight with Ram Gopal Verma and shortly after that made out with him. Okay, <laughs> that got three and a half million views on YouTube. And for those who don't know, that is a takeoff of a very famous, a very successful Indian uh, news anchor called Arnab Goswami, who has exactly that confrontational style. Um, and he's probably the biggest thing on sort of uh, English language uh, new, uh, news television in India. Um, so the point is that there's some really good original viral digital content out there in India. Um, here's another example. This is, um, again for those who don't know, <laughs> this guy is probably India's biggest film star. And his thing is, I mean not only is he huge and famous and all that stuff, but he's sort of India's Chuck Norris in the sense that many many internet memes have been devoted to this man. So he joined Twitter yesterday and already has like 300,000 followers. And then, of course, then the Twitter-based meme starts. So you don't uh, join Twitter. You sign up to follow Rajnikanth. You forget your password. No matter. You ask Rajnikanth. And that's kind of the, you know, very Chuck Norrisy, very Bruce Schneiery. Um, <laughs> that's from a site called fakingnews.com, which is kind of an Indian version of The Onion. There's loads of others. There's the Hoot, which is a, a media sort of focus site. Uh, another video site called AIB. Um, look it up if you want to. I'm not going to tell you what, what it stands for or certainly what it translates to. Um, Scoop Whoop, which is kind of like BuzzFeed. Story Pick, which is a bit like Upworthy. And the point is that um, to produce su really successful content in India, you really have to understand the Indian audience. Because in India's internet users, now more than ever, with people of lower income speaking many different languages beyond English moving online. It's a really, really comp complex group. Um, India, probably in this respect, is the most diverse country in the world. And the question of who this new user is is the central point of everything if you're a platform designer or a content creator. And it's really complex and really challenging. And to work out what content and what platforms work for these people who share very few common languages, vastly different income levels, you've got caste, you've got race, you've got uh, relig religion, the whole thing contained in one country. And then loads of them as well. Um, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, here at Harvard I've been sort of looking at um, user-centered design and the basic idea is, this is from a business school class, uh, but there's similar sort of projects at the engineering school and, and the grad school of design. And the idea is, and it really applies in, for media makers, is you know, really understanding who your audience is, really sort of walking through the basics of who it is you're creating content for. That whole, that whole top-down model that I've grown up with, you know, of someone like the BBC or like any newspaper telling you what's what. And the audience, you either go with it or you don't. You know, it's not going to work in future, and certainly not in India, with, the, with that variety of, of groups in the country. So you really have to understand, using principles like this, um, who your audience is. And you know, not just what their media consumption is, or how they use their phones, but how they live their lives, and what they do every day, and what are the points at which they're going to pick up a phone. And then when they pick up a phone, what are they going to do with it? You really have to tell a story about that user, and understand the culture, or probably more accurately, the cultures. Um, you know, do some really deep level ethnography. I mean, a friend of ours, Trisha Wang, who is a Berkman Fellow, has done really brilliant work on this in China, where she spent, you know, months with with China, young Chinese internet users to understand 
not just their behavior online, but just what they do, what their lives are like. And then from that, you can extrapolate um, what kind of content, what kind of platforms might work for them. So in India, there is a big appetite for news. Um, there is, you know, newspaper sales almost uniquely in the world are going up. Um, TV stations, although they're not making any money, you know, are doing well. The ratings are doing well. Um, sooner or later, especially given the fact that the population of India, the, you know, about half the population of India is under the age of 25, and they're all buying smartphones, let's say for argument's sake, that news consumption is going to have to move online, on, on digital at some point. But there are massive challenges, and I've kind of mentioned one already. You know, there are 20 odd official languages in India and then many more dialects within that. So even if you are from a Hindi speaking part of the country, you, your Hindi may not be the same as somebody else's 50 miles down the road. Um, and that's a problem for a, for, a, for a content creator because, or a platform designer because if you're trying to scale a service, you've got to think about translation, you've got to think about cultural differences, you've got to think about all sorts of things, employ more staff to do it. No one speaks all 20 languages. Um, Literacy is also still a problem. Um, you know, 25% of people are not literate at all. A decent enough proportion of the remaining 75% are only functionally literate. And then you've got the other issue of digital literacy. Um, people who may have a smartphone for the first time, but have not had that progression from other devices, from, the, from desktops to tablets and all the rest of it. That's a problem that needs to be addressed as well. Um, and I mentioned this earlier. These phones are not iPhones. That Android phone I showed you probably can't even support the Facebook app, um, which is, explains the immense popularity of chat apps. And I'll come back to that later as well. But these are not iPhones. These don't have massive processing capabilities. And the connections themselves can be erratic. I mean, even in the middle of Delhi, often you can find your 3G signal drops out and turns to 2G, and you have to kind of manipulate it. I mean, it's getting better, of course, but it happens even in the big cities. The other really big thing is low attention span. This doesn't mean that people are stupid and they don't know what they're doing and they don't understand things. It just means that there's some research that suggests that even sort of educated, wealthy, you know, engaged people only spend about maximum about 10% of their time on news apps on their smartphones. You spend a lot more time on other things, on social apps and all the rest of it, but 10% on news. And the lower you, the lower you go down the income scale or um, the, the less well-educated you are, the lower that number becomes. So you've got the competition for people's time. If someone's got a smartphone, they're going to want entertainment, they're going to want mobile money maybe, a load of other things before they bother with news. So again, for a news person, it's a big challenge to kind of capture that audience in the face of such competition from other types of services, other distractions that they've got. So what does news look like in this environment and how might it be distributed? given the fact that you can't expect people to go to your app. Um, and I mentioned this already a few times, but chat apps are huge in India, and they're getting bigger and bigger. And I'm quite pleased that my own guys at the BBC have pioneered um, a really good news service on WhatsApp. They, they recognize quite early on, they've got, they've got WeChat as well, and actually in Nigeria, for those who are interested, they're launching a news service on BlackBerry Messenger. Um, these, are, these, these are not chat apps anymore, really. These are social networks, but operating at a much lower level of bandwidth. You can post photos, you can post videos, you can see your friend's status updates, you can have groups, you can do all those things. They're, these are mini social networks, and they just don't take up as much space on your phone as, as, a, as a Facebook would, or, or even a Twitter would. Um, and this graphic actually explains things even better. Um, WhatsApp has nearly 50 million users in India, and it's growing really fast. If you look at how people, the primary form of communication with people's friends, email's going down from quite a low base anyway. SMS is going down. Phone calls are going down, which is kind of fairly intuitive. Social media is going up slightly, but chat apps are not only growing the fastest, but they are the primary form of communication now for, you know, for between friends, between acquaintances. And for news 
organizations and any kind of content creators, that's a big opportunity right there. And I think it's going to become a huge driver of traffic. So I've been going back to the beginning. I was here to look at this sort of basic idea of the internet growing and what it means for uh, digital news in India. And rather than, I tried really hard to find things to research, companies to research, working in precisely this area. I really couldn't find anything. There, is, there isn't a lot that's visible, certainly. There's probably some people working on it. There's not much that's visible. People designing new services, digital new services for that non-English speaking, low literacy, low attention span, low bandwidth audience, which is massive um, as a sort of business opportunity, but also as, you know, if you believe in sort of journalism as a social good, it's, um, it's also a great opportunity there. So I decided to kind of play around with a few designs myself. I've no idea if this is any good because, frankly, I need to go to India and play around with it and do that ethnography, do that testing, do the prototyping. You can't do it here. Um, but when, and again, the Indians in the room will, will understand this, when we were growing up, especially those of us who grew up outside, the, outside India, we learnt all about Indian mythology and culture and history through comic books. They're massive, and, and, and all Indian children, pretty much all Indian children, read them. Um, so I thought I would, given those restrictions, to think of news in comic book form. And so I thought of this. This is just a really basic mock-up of what it m might look like. And the idea is to kind of present news and all essential information um, in sort of eight to ten frames, which is very easy on a basic device. It's shareable, it's hopefully engaging, it it's feeds that appetite for news. It doesn't require high levels of literacy. You can have optional audio for those who can't read at all. And furthermore, you can supply a template for users to supply their own content as well. You know, I've got, this is just the most basic idea. I've no idea if it's gonna work. And the only way to find out if it's gonna work is if, you know, is to go to India and load up a few Android phones with a basic prototype and take data and talk to people. And when I say take data, bearing in mind the immense privacy concerns of doing that, um, but also talk to people, conduct intensive interviews. The other thing is that it, you can only start in one part of India at a time. You, you know, I'm going to pick Gujarat just because I speak the language and I understand the culture better and it's got slightly better infrastructure than most places. But, you know, then only you can scale maybe to other parts of the country and think about how other parts of the country might, might use a service like this. So India's digital revolution is taking place, despite the sort of societal restrictions I mentioned earlier on, and despite my own previous skepticism. The challenges are really big, but the opportunity is too. And that's it. half hour or more for questions. Sam? You just mentioned that you were going to go to one of the places that has the, the best infrastructure, essentially, or one of the better. Yes, yeah, slightly better, yeah. So I was just curious about that choice. Um, well, it was, it's know? less to do with the infrastructure, more to do with the okay. fact that um, I speak the language. I think if you're going to try and operate in, in any language, it's better to know it. <laughs> okay. I didn't know if you were making uh, an assumption that going into a place with better infrastructure would be uh, a better place to, to try well, and meant, out. Or... I should, have, should be clear. I mean, it has got, well, there are arguments over this, but in, certainly in terms of um, connectivity, it is a bit better than most places. Sure. Okay. So um, I'm curious, it sounds like, you know, this idea of knowing your user is certainly good to highlight. And, um, but it sounds like such a time of rapid change as far as who those users are, just in a very, you know, not only, um, you know, whether they have the device or access to the networks and or whether they, you know, are, are in this knowing about certain media or following certain media. So it's like, it sounds like a, a huge challenge. It's very different from what editors in this country or other countries would experience. How do you manage that, like, fast-moving change? Like, maybe, maybe you have a, you know, how do you manage the fact that even if you answer the question correctly today, that it'll be probably a different, very different answer in a year or six months. Jeff, you, you just try and keep up. I mean, it's really hard. You just make sure you're surrounded by smart people who are on the case. But beyond that, media is really 
I mean, all, especially with the journalists in the room, we know that audiences are fickle. You know, it's not, an, you know, unless you, I mean, the BBC is one thing because it's really old and we've got that established. But it's not by, all, by any means certain that we're going to retain that any, that's even us. And so you just, you just try and you just try and keep up with, with, with technological developments, with changing user needs, with everything that's going on around you. But it's, it's not easy. Has it, I know you said you wouldn't talk about politics, but can I take back to the beginning and John Oliver promising everybody a toilet, or Miranda, Narendra Modi promising everybody a toilet. Is there a difference in the sort of digital literacy of the two campaigns, of the Congress and, and the BJP? Uh, yeah, um, the Congress candidate doesn't tweet. He doesn't have a social media presence. No, he doesn't at all. Um, so that's the, the biggest difference of all. The, 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 the BJP and the Modi campaign have embraced technology much, much earlier on. I mean, for years, not just for this, for this election. It's been going on for several years. And the, the rivals have only just caught on. In, in Delhi, um, so sort of late last year, an anti-corruption, for those who don't know, an anti-corruption party, the Aam Admi Party, uh, won, won the election, won, well, pretty much won the election and had a chief minister. And they were born almost entirely through, you know, internet campaigns against corruption. So it's something that politicians should do. And it's, there's a lot of criticism in India, I guess, that the Congress hasn't embraced this. And uh, would you be prepared to say that that would be a deciding factor? No. Really? Because the, 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 the Indian electorate is 800 million. And assuming that say a quarter of them are connected to the internet. Oh yes, no, there, there are impacts beyond that because what happens on the internet is then published in a newspaper or it goes on TV. I don't think it's a deciding factor. I think it's a big factor. I wouldn't say it's a deciding factor. I've read a fair amount about how Indian, there's a, a lot of verticality in the business of digital media technology so that telecoms are invested in the content production and are also invested in the marketing and promotion of content. So as soon as you buy a phone, suddenly you'll, as, as Melody Bitt told us last week, you'll find all sorts of people marketing to you and there's a lot of data security, but there's also this kind of direct line between companies, news production companies and others who are producing content and the platforms that which, um, upon which you receive it. Um, I wonder if you could comment about that in terms of how it affects political dynamics and also what does it mean for you if you're trying to compete in that environment? Um, I'm not sure if I'm trying to compete. Uh, for me, this is still just research and just sort of playing around with some ideas. It's not like this is a startup and I'm going to go ahead and do it. But, but yeah, I mean, it's a big problem. Big conglomerates who have fingers in many pies also own most media companies. And it's a problem in terms of as Mal mentioned, sort of journalistic objectivity. I mean, a lot of journalism, we've got this phenomenon, well, I say we, they've got this phenomenon in India, um, paid news, in which you, you can, the, the, the allegation is that you can get favorable coverage for yourself or unfavorable coverage for a rival through, you know, various kinds of manip manipulation. And it's made a lot easier if you own the company yourself. Um, so, I mean, someone can talk a bit more about this, but media ownership in India is a massive problem. And that lack of independence um, has obvious consequences in terms of trustworthiness of material and quality of content as well. David. Are there any lessons from like successes in terms of what uh, other digital content producers are doing, for example, like Bollywood or entertainment people trying to sort of take advantage of the digital platform that you think are applicable to news? To, no, not really. I mean. News is hard because, you know, traditionally, if say in a newspaper, news was the bit that, that didn't that lost money. You know, news has never really made any money, um, and you know it's propped up by the sports pages or the horoscopes or the classifieds or whatever. Um, so not really. I mean, unless you can make news really entertaining, but unfortunately, most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's functional. It's a bit dull. It's important and worthy and all those things, but it's not going to grab you like a a music video would or anything else would. Where could religion and gender fall into the mix? Sorry? Religion and gender fall into the mix, which you presented today. 
I don't know about religion, but mm -hmm. certainly um, mobile phone distribution is unequal among genders. More male than yeah. Than women. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, have you looked at your mock-up here reminds me of the, the Italian, I think it's called Fumaretti, which are photographs of comic books. And I know in the 50s, they were very, very um, popular in Italy. And I know that in the, in the comic book culture here in the United States, there's a lot of political comics. And it would be interesting to look at other cultures and how they use comic books, whether they use them for news, and how that might translate to India. Also, last week, Vanu Bose of Vanu Inc. spoke at MIT, and he's done work in Nepal with uh, accessible phone and internet networks and is now rolling out something for Africa, trying to do an independent cell phone network for Africa that can bring people online. It might be interesting to, to talk to someone like him who is, is dealing with the bottom billion or the bottom two billion, trying to bring them online to also talk about information services. Yeah, thank you. Could I make a suggestion just in terms of making news entertaining? There are obviously, and it seems to me, Indian stories that suit your storyboard idea very well. And think about train crashes. Um, you know, the number of train crashes that we hear about in India, you know, and it's a very graphic, grabby sort of a thing. If you can, if you can deal with that. It, have you thought through other scenarios in which this comic book is actually going to be a most effective way of communicating? I don't know if I made it clear. I mean, I, I don't think I've got in this context. I've got a really broad conception of news. Um, it doesn't have to be the latest political goings on in Delhi or whatever. It doesn't have to be that. I mean, what we call news, say in the UK, you know, the Prime Minister sneezes is news, right? And it doesn't have to be like that here. I I, I think of it more as essential information. So, for example, say you've got a um, a local doctor who has a service that you know he or she wants to advertise to pregnant women and doesn't know how to get the message out there that's really useful right and it's not it's not um, it's not it's not an advert it's not commercial gain I put that in, in news I so this platform a platform like this can be used for much more than um, news and current events it can be used just for all kinds of essential information where, where messages need to get out to as many people as possible. And, and by definition, it can stay up there longer too, because right. my train crash is really good one day, and then the next right. day it's pretty old hat. Right, exactly. Um, this is a rather interesting idea, and uh, you, do, you certainly do have a set of challenges ahead of you. But uh, I'm curious um, as to who curates this news. Because you just said, I mean, the Prime Minister in, in the UK sneezes and that's news, whereas in India it's different. So who gets to curate this news and do people get to do that? Initially, initially, <laughs> it would be, um, you'd need to have like an editor or something, you know, whether it's me or, or anybody else. But the, ultimately, and this is where it needs a lot more work, of course, Ultimately, I, I want to have a template where people can supply their own content and not only supply their own content, but have a means to, whether it's up or down voting or you know, whatever the best mechanism is, but also curate and, and decide what goes where and what goes top and what, what doesn't. So, but that's, that's for much later on. Any kind of attempts to bypass the, um, the written illiteracy problem with the smartphones? So with the feature phones, it's mostly text-based interaction, but with smartphones, you might have the opportunity to do entirely visually-based applications yeah. and content sharing. Is there any development in that space or marketing in that space? That's there, there is. There's, 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 a, there's a scientist I've been talking to. He's based in, he's, he's Danish. And I spoke to him the other day, and he's done a lot of work on um, user interfaces for illiterate people. Um, his thing is about um, apps, agriculture, and crop prices, and those sort of apps, and how people can, can convey that information and, su and supply information without needing words. 
you know, easily identifiable symbols and what works and what doesn't. There's a lot of work that's gone in that area as well. Are there any deployments in India? Uh, there, there, there are pilot schemes, nothing massive at the moment, no. They're, just, they're still trying to work out what works and, and, and agree upon some kind, I don't know if that can even happen, but agree upon some kind of common standard. That would be the ideal, yeah. but it's India and that tends never to work. So then the chat app applications you were talking about aren't um, tapping into that audience of illiterate people they at are. all? No, they are. They are because well, you can... you have chat and... You can have chat through... Well, people send pictures and things. The pictures of themselves and things. I mean, it's not the richest, com most complete experience, but there's no reason why they can't use them. And they do. So that use is like... So you, you touched upon understanding your audience in the myriad ways. So I'm curious to know what who exactly is the audience for this because kids grow up <coughs> reading comics and this seems like um, a good, you know, good channel for them, but they're not necessarily going to be thinking about the election or what have you. So, are you seeing this as something that you would want to target just to kids or to people who are illiterate and much older but still want to understand these issues? Okay. Are you focusing on one group? Or? Well, I mean, I need to go to India and play around with this. I mean, this this has been conceived in Cambridge. I mean, really. It's, you know, it's, I can't claim that I know what the user wants sitting here. I've got, I've got a better intuition than most, perhaps because I've worked there a lot and I kind of get the, get the culture a bit better, but really this needs testing out there. And I don't think it's just kids who read comics. I mean, if you think of graphic novels, that's not kids. So, it, you know, that, that audience is potentially there, but I need to go there and find out. What's that voice? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, for, for people who can't read at all, um, I would have an optional audio soundtrack, and also the you know using the microphone. If you're creating content, you can use as well. Yeah. Any more questions? What's the character penetration? TVs are pretty much universal. I mean, everyone's got, if they haven't got one in their own house, they've got yeah. access to one. Smartphones, I think it's currently around 150 million, um, with another 200 or so million to be added this year. So, and again, the shared access to some cases, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about the the use of um, BBC and other institutional media using these chat apps? How are they using them? Are they using them mainly just to push short versions of their stories out, or are they trying to actually start a dialogue? Or are they trying to get survey? Or how exactly are they using the chat apps? There's two. There's two. I mean, I've not been personally involved in this, but there are two strands to this. One is that um, back in back in the old days, we had we the BBC broadcast in India on shortwave radio, and that was mainly a low income rural audience. Um, at some point, sort of later on, we targeted much wealthier English-speaking elites, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. Um, this is our kind of an attempt to reclaim that old, lower-income audience. Um, I think for now, it's a broadcast medium. I, th I think that they're trying to work out how to uh, allow people to submit content as well but then how would curation work how would the logistics in the BBC office in London sort of work who would need to like deal with all that stuff that's yet to be worked out I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about censorship the way that it affects mainstream news outlets and the extent to which this might get around some of the issues around censorship in India and blocking certain kinds of content. I've not really thought a huge amount about it. I mean, like, m certainly my work in India has never been subject to that because, you know, I, I guess if you work for a big foreign uh, broadcaster, you don't need to worry so much about it. Um, but if this, okay, this is just, you know, if this was to become an 
Indian based, <coughs> Indian owned, Indian run service, then it would be subject to the problems that everybody else faces. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, one way is to avoid um, Indian investment and have it all sort of paid for from outside. <coughs> then you're out of that sort of system a little bit. But censorship in India is not. It's not as bad as it is, is it, as it is elsewhere, certainly in neighboring countries. Um, and f for foreign broadcasters like the one I work for, it's not an issue at all. Any last questions? Did you want to add any further thoughts before we wrap up? Or? No, no, I've kind of uh, spoken for long enough, I think.